up in Philadelphia, and my grandfather was a Sunday painter. He had been trained as a classical pianist, but when he came to the States, he had to earn a living, as he did as a contractor. Uh, but he painted on Sundays. And my mother, she grew up in Camden, New Jersey, and during the Depression, she was doing drawings for the little shops. But she had to earn a living, uh, so she went to secretarial school and she became a secretary. But when I was growing up, she would draw for us, and she would take a blank sheet of paper and a pencil, and suddenly something would appear on that paper, and it was just fascinating. So as soon as I started drawing, she really encouraged me. When I was very young, and I remember seeing Rockwell, I remember sort of the, the amusing stories that, of this friendly, small town life. I grew up in a, a really rough part of Philadelphia. This was nothing I could identify with. Uh, I mean, my school was burned down when I was nine years old. This was not the life I, I knew. This was another America, but I think there was a time where suddenly I became aware, and that's when he did a painting that really touched me, and that was the problem we all live with. And that's when suddenly Rockwell meant something to me, and I said, okay, good. He's in the world that I'm paying attention to that means something to me, and not that the other wasn't important, but that was like a faraway land and charming, but I knew a rougher world. And then I started looking into what he was saying. And not only that, I was grateful. I was really grateful that this man who spoke to the heartland of this country was saying, look at this now, start paying attention to this. I think he really um, gave the country a gift to make them focus on that because I don't think everybody could have made them focus the way he could have. He had their confidence and loyalty in the way other people didn't. When I was 10 years old, I started classes at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I ended up going to college at, it was then the Museum College of Art and it was affiliated with the museum. I didn't know how one earned a living as an artist. When I was growing up, women were secretaries, nurses, or teachers. That first year I met Claire Van Vliet, who was in printmaking, and I wanted to take illustrations so I could learn to do book covers. I wanted to take printmaking and illustration. There was an old Vandercook at the school, and she literally taught me how to print on that old Vandercook. And uh, we would work the presses, and um, she would give me this beautiful paper, which I couldn't afford as a student, and teach me how to bind books, and it was extraordinary. Uh, I also learned etching and lithography, but it was woodcut that I really loved. I came up to New York and went to the magazines, Good Housekeeping and Ladies Home Journal. The last one we went to was Red Book Magazine. And it was the end of the day and there was no one at the desk. And so I went through a door to find a place to drop off the portfolio. There was uh, Bob Ciano. He was the associate art director at the time and Rosti Heimsmont and they had me open the portfolio and uh, Bob gave me a job on the spot. And I remember coming back to my college and my um, department head for illustration and saying, I got a job, I got a job. And he just said, you'll never get another. But I was, it gave me confidence. It made me feel like maybe this was something I could support myself with until I could be a fine artist. I grew up in a black neighborhood in Philly, in North Philly. And when we moved to Jersey, suddenly I was in a white neighborhood. 
And I was very aware that I was suddenly surrounded by white people instead of black people, and suddenly aware that every place I looked, not only were there white people, but all the magazines and all the TV programs, everybody was white. And the first book I was given was a book of poetry called Once. That was my first Alice Walker book. The first book I did for Coetzee, um, Waiting for the Barbarians, ended up being banned in the South. This was in the early 80s. The next book that they gave me was called The Life and Times of Michael Kay. Michael Kay was a black man, and they didn't want a black person on the cover. When you're working on a job, which is what illustration is, you're trying to visualize the, what somebody else has thought and written. And I always felt that was my job. You really want to be honest and loyal to what that writer has put in that book, and you want to if somebody comes, is picking up that book, I felt like my job was to communicate what that writer was trying to say. There were not that many women in the business. It took a long time. Women illustrators, the few that there were, were doing fashion and children's book work, and then you could do women's magazines. It hurt me very much a couple times when I found out that I wasn't being paid the same as the males were being paid. The art director said, I just can't pay a woman what I pay a man. I just can't do it. I'm not of that generation. And I remember talking to Fred about it, Fred Marcelino. And after that, Fred said, this is what I get paid for here, and this is what I get paid for there, and you have to get paid the same. I've always tried to be inclusive, even before I knew what inclusive was. When I did the, my three books, half the writings are women. They are multicultural. I would always do that whenever, right from the beginning, because I knew how hard it was for myself and the people I knew. And I think it's just important to keep including women and not forget that it's important that it's half of the population. It's just very important to do that. Here there is this idea that illustration is a lesser art, but having been in both worlds, it's a more professional business because you are treated like a, for the most part, not maybe when you're first starting out but when you're in the business, you are definitely treated like a professional for the most part. Your work is protected by copyright. When you do a piece of fine art, you don't know if it's going to be sold. If it is sold, you may not get a, you won't get a bill of sale. You'll be told what it was sold, but you won't see anything specific. So artists all the time find out that something was sold for a lot more or a discount was given that they weren't told about, or they don't know where it's going, they don't know if they'll ever see it again. Things disappear in back rooms or they get lost and there's no compensation for artists. It's a very, very different business. I found when I first started showing, trying to show my paintings, it was better not to say I was an illustrator. The funny thing was that my friends were in publishing and graphic arts. They started coming to my shows, and so they started asking some of the uh, people, the art directors started using my paintings on the book covers. So some of my paintings started becoming used as illustrations, and they would just put some type on there, and they had a ready-made illustration. Um, so there started to, things started getting a little mixed up and I started doing printmaking for my fine art because I started carving out the bridges of New York City in woodcut and linoleum cut. And now that I'm doing collages, I do poetry collages and I do collages influenced by books. The oil paintings were of dream imagery from my studies with Jungian theory. The watercolors were portraits of people I met 
the landscape around me, which since I lived near the Seine were the bridges of Paris, and um, little still lifes. And then of course the irony was that when I did move back to New York, I used the Jungian theory for Robertson Davies, who was a Jungian, and the landscape and bridges and still life really became the work of my paintings. The bridges are structures that are extraordinary to me. They're just fantastic, and I've loved exploring them. And I had just finished a, a big show on the Brooklyn Bridge. I found out that I had a benign brain tumor, and uh, when that was taken care of, and I found out that I had something that was damaged called my proprioception. So I'm taking pictures, but I'm sort of disoriented. And I call my doctor and I said, I don't, I can't figure out my space anymore. And they said, oh, well, your proprioception has been affected. I suddenly was seeing space in a very different way. Once I got over being angry, it sort of became fascinating. So I started putting the photographs together differently. I started making a new space from, from those details. And then it got to just be more and more fun. Books that Jerome Sharon did on Emily Dickinson the poem she wrote about the, the lives of women at that time who would spend their lives sewing and cooking for their families and that was their lives and that was the lives of the women of my family. They, they learned this from the, their mothers and grandmothers, their aunts, as I did. And it was the art of women. It was, it was, what, it was one of the few professions they could go into. Since then, I've done several collages that incorporate needles and thread and a little bit of sewing, and it's a different way of working. It's almost like working inside out. Instead of looking at something and then trying to put that down on a page, it's putting something down on a page and then seeing how it grows. The things that meant a lot to me was that I was able to do a lot of work that was political in the direction, let's say, the liberal ways that I think, able to do it in a strong way, that I was able to work with a lot of minds that I really respected. That was really an honor and, you know, as a child I never thought I would have a chance to do that. I was able to work with some extraordinary authors, you know, whose work I loved reading. I mean, it was every time I would get one of the manuscripts, it was like a, a gift. Mm -hmm.